The topic for this session is be determined to fellowship only those who are in fellowship with God. This is Brother Charles Poe's second time to speak to us. Again, he's a native Texan from Liberty Hill, and he's been preaching since he was a teenager. He currently preaches for the Cedar Street Congregation in Granby, Missouri. He's authored n numerous tracts and books and numbers of articles published. We're grateful to have uh, Charles and Linda, his wife, with us, and we wish them the best and a safe trip as they return home. And please come speak to us on this timely subject. Thank you. If someone will promise to wake me up if I go to sleep after that good lunch, I would appreciate it. There are things that we as Christians must do to remain faithful to our God. To suggest that we are faithful to God also suggests that we are in fellowship with God. And the fact of the matter is <clears throat> that if others are not faithful to God, they are not in fellowship with Him, and therefore they're not in fellowship with me. If I'm faithful to God. We used an illustration in the book, the beginning of our lesson, but I have a slightly different one that I want to call your attention to. A week or so ago, I received a copy of The Yoke Fellow, which has the itinerary for this year's MSOP lectures. The theme is still standing, but not standing still. <clears throat> Brother Clark had an article in the front of it. It's a good article. But it induced me to open the page and hunt through the topics to see if there was a lesson assigned to someone still standing for the New Testament doctrine of fellowship. I didn't find it. Really, I'm not surprised. But I am deeply saddened by it. Because I never hear those kinds of things from those brethren anymore. I don't see it in the bulletins. And I look at their bulletins all the time. Never see it in the Oak Fellow. They still send it to me. I don't know why, but they do. There is a problem there with fellowship because of some of the men, at least, that appear on their lectures now. Knowing where some of those brethren have uh, spoken before and had fellowship with, it's a great uh, concern to me. And naturally it raises a passage of scripture that when I was in school I heard all the time. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not in your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Addressing this subject calls upon us at first to answer the question, just what is fellowship? 
I suppose that after the Greek word agape, which everyone knows means love, perhaps the second best known Greek word among members of the church is koinonia, <clears throat> which is translated fellowship. And the word means things such as joint participation, communion, association, intercourse. Now, now I, for one, find it strange that participating on a lectureship where there are false teachers on the program is association, but it's not fellowship. You have probably seen that claim. Don't misunderstand me. There is a way in which association is not fellowship. We all understand that. But I would suggest to you that speaking on a lectureship where there is also a false teacher is not in that category. But beyond that, there is question that arises in my mind, why are you defending the false teacher that you're appearing with and not realizing that the congregation or entity that invited both of you invited the false teacher and so you're in error by fellowshipping the congregation by attending, uh, participating, speaking on their lectureship before you ever get to the question of the false teacher that's on there with you. But I don't know of anyone who's thinking about that or pointing that out very much. Fellowship, what is it? It's joint participation. It is communion. Well, what I'm concerned about, first of all, is being in fellowship with God. And there are two questions involved with that. The first one is, <clears throat> how do I get into fellowship with God? This is not in the book, but I would invite you to open your New Testaments to Acts chapter 2. And I want us to notice a few verses from the hub of the Bible. First of all is verses 22 and 23. These are familiar words to you, I know. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him, in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determining counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, I doubt that there is anyone who would say that these individuals who took a man approved of God and slew him would be in fellowship with God. But Peter proceeds from that point, and he mentions a number of things, including some prophecies spoken of by David. And then we come down to verse 36, and we find this, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now if God has made one, this Jesus, both Lord and Christ, and they crucified him, they weren't in fellowship with him. They were in fellowship with the others who joined them in crucifying him, but they were not in fellowship with God. However, in the next verse, we read this. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, it is obvious from the reading that they knew they had done something wrong 
But they themselves realized that they were out of fellowship with God through this crucifying the one whom God has made Lord in Christ. Because they asked the question, what shall we do? I would suggest to you that that question implies that they now believe. And then in verse 38, we have the answer that we are so familiar with. To repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Peter tells them what they are to do. Are they in fellowship with God? Are they in fellowship with Christ? Not yet. Verses 40 and 41, and with many other words, did he exhort. Testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, catch this, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, are they in fellowship with God now? How do I know that? The next verse. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They could not continue in something in which they were not. They could not continue in fellowship unless they were now in fellowship. And they were. And as a matter of fact, we're very familiar too with the last verse of the chapter. Praising God and having favor with all the people of the Lord add to the church daily, such as should be saved. So now they are in fellowship with God. They are in fellowship with this Christ whom they had slain with their wicked hands. They are in fellowship with the apostles. And they are in fellowship one with the other. But then there is a second question. That second question is, when I come into fellowship with my God and with those others who are in fellowship with God, how do I maintain that? How do I continue that fellowship? I don't know of any verse that answers that any more easily than 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. We are in fellowship with him. We must continue to walk in the light to continue to be in fellowship with God and with those who are faithful. I don't know any other more simple way to put it. A number of years ago, my wife was in a neighboring town, and she called me said she had car trouble. And I called one of the brethren in the church there. He said, I'll run you over there, and, and you can help her. On the way, he looked at me, and he said, I'm going to sin Sunday night. And I thought, that sounds awfully strange. That he would even admit it. He went on to explain, I am participating in a golf tournament Sunday afternoon, and if I do not finish my round before time for services, I will go ahead and finish my round of golf. I thought, brother, you're in the wrong congregation. I know one that has now advertised that they really don't have a problem if a member of the church wants to participate in a sporting event and miss the services of the church. You know who I'm talking about, probably. If we are to remain in fellowship with God, we have to continue to walk in the light. And we have to avoid those fellowships that are evil in the sight of God we have to avoid fellowship with those who are not in fellowship with God. And let's make sure that we understand 
in terms of our day, that that includes those who are in the denominational bodies, because those folks are not in fellowship with God. But I'm reminded of the writing of Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 14, and he shows us some very important facts concerning this matter. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what? And here's our word. Fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. That's a rhetorical question. The answer is none. And what communion? Hath light with darkness. There's one of our words that describes what fellowship is, isn't it? Communion. None is again the answer to that rhetorical question. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? None. And what agreement with, hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. None. Wherefore, come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, but watch this, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We must walk in the light, and we must not have fellowship with those things that are against the will of God. We can easily see, can't we, the, the connection between being faithful to God how to remain faithful to Christ and being very particular about our fellowships. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition, that is the handing downs, the divine traditions, the heavenly traditions, which he received of us. Second Thessalonians 3, 6. And then to Timothy, he wrote this charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest by them war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away, Concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. It's 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. Now what does Paul mean when he said, I delivered them unto Satan? He withdrew fellowship from them. Why? Because they were teaching something that was false. So then we have no fellowship with those who are outside of Christ. We have no fellowship with those who have obeyed the gospel, but who are no longer walking in the light, who are no longer walking faithfully. But then another question might be, well, may one have fellowship with one who fellowships one who is not in fellowship with God? See, we're taking this a step farther. Not just with that one who's not in fellowship with God, but with that one who fellowships one who is not in fellowship with God. In the situation in, to, in the Lord's church today, among those of our brethren who used to be in our minds very faithful, isn't that really the, the question? Isn't that really the situation? Isn't that really what we are hearing defended? We often hear the argument, I fellowship him in as much as he is faithful to the truth, but I do not fellowship him in his error. A few years ago, down those stomping grounds of Brother Brown in Camden, Arkansas, a nationwide television preacher learned that he could not uh, fellowship a certain false teacher uh, in where that false teacher stood for the truth, as long as they, or as long as he recognized the error that the man held, well, he lost the support of that congregation, and rightfully so. I wonder 
if Hymenaeus and Philetus, who taught that the resurrection was already past, taught the truth on baptism, you know what? Doesn't matter. Doesn't make any difference. When Peter came to Antioch, in Galatians chapter 2, and verse 11, did Paul run up to Peter and commend him on the things that he practiced faithfully? No. He was still into his face because of his hypocritical action. Was Simon the sorcerer really in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity just because he tried to buy the gift of laying on of hands with money? He had obeyed the, the gospel, hadn't he? Yeah. We're told that he did. He singled out as one who did. But Pete said, you're in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. Pray God. That perhaps the thought and the intent of thine heart might be forgiven thee. Now, what if someone had come along and they had said to Peter, Well, now look, Peter. Simon's not really all that bad. He obeyed the gospel, didn't he? Even if he, even if he says, No, I'm not going to repent of this trying to buy the gift of God laying on hands. You can, you can fellowship in so much as he obeyed the gospel. Just don't fellowship him in uh, regards to him trying to buy the gift. I don't know anybody who would buy such a silly argument. But why do they do it today? Why can't they see through that same kind of situation today. We may not fellowship those who fellowship those who are not in fellowship with God because when they fellowship one who fellowships uh, one who is a false teacher, then they too are out of fellowship. You see, uh, C becomes B and B becomes A, the way it is. We need to be very, very careful about those with whom we say, well, you know, I, I'm in fellowship with him. Because he may be supporting someone who's a false teacher. Then another question. Just why? Why is this important? Why should we determine to fellowship only those who are in fellowship with God? Let me put it in words that are just a little bit different. Why should I care whether or not the person is in fellowship with God? Why should I care? One reason Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, when he is rebuking them for their action and also their inaction toward the man that had taken his father's wife. In verse 6, he said a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. When I preached out in West Texas, we had as one of the members of the congregation there, the superintendent of the schools. He said, one uh, rotten apple in a barrel does not ruin the whole barrel. He didn't know any more about chemistry than he did about Spiritual matters. Of course, he was talking about spiritual matters. He said this trying to defend Abilene Christian University, by the way, with what you're doing. Why should we care? Not only because a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump, but also because, as Paul writes concerning Hymenaeus and Philetus, that their error would eat like a canker. He puts it a little bit differently, that doesn't he? You see, it spreads. And it spreads fast. You know the old saying? Bad news travels fast. Good news travels kind of slow. That's the way it is with 
You know, it seems like that which is right and good in the sight of God, it spreads kind of slow. But when you have error, it spreads just like the wildfire. I don't know, but just exactly, I tried to find this out and I couldn't find any, any numbers on it. Maybe someone else knows. Just how many congregations of the Lord's church are now using instrumental music? Maybe someone knows. If you do, I'd appreciate having the information. But I know one thing. It's spreading, it's spreading. I don't know how many congregations that teach, well, it's all right to have the Lord's Supper on Thursday night or Friday night. I know that there are young uh, couples now who are demanding that they can partake of the Lord's Supper when they get married. And there are even those who say we should observe the Lord's Supper at a funeral. And you can count on it. That kind of error is going to spread like kudzu in Kentucky. And if you've been to Kentucky and seen that kudzu, you know what I mean. Of course, we have great concern also for the individual who is in error. Not just the congregation or not just congregations, but we have concern for the individual who goes off into that which is against the will of God. That's really what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians 5, wasn't it? He was concerned about that brother. He didn't say withdraw from this man because you hate him. Someone the other night said that a withdrawal of fellowship is not because of hate. It's because of love. It is for the purpose of making that individual stop and think and see that what they are doing is wrong in the sight of God. Well, there are other reasons to practice discipline. When one has broken rank, when one has removed himself from fellowship with God and therefore from fellowship with the faithful. One of those reasons is that if we continue to fellowship those who are in sin, we destroy our influence. Years ago, where I grew up, and some of you probably know where that little town is. We had a, a brother there who left his wife. And at first, he just moved in and lived with a, uh, another woman until he was able to finalize a divorce against the good wife that he had. And then went through the legal steps to marry this other woman. They still allowed that man to help with the Lord's table. When somebody suggested we should withdraw fellowship from him, oh, no, no, no. Can't do that. If we do that, we'll run him off. Well, he'd already run himself off. He had already run himself off from fellowship with God. So he had already run himself off from fellowship with the faithful. We wonder, why is it that some walk disorderly? There are a lot of reasons. There may be about as many reasons as there are people that do that thing. Now we admit some do it out of ignorance and they can be taught out of their ignorance. And we have to mention this, long before corrective discipline is exercised, instructive discipline has to be done. We must try to restore those who have erred. We know that Paul taught the Galatians that in Galatians 6 first two verses there but then there are some more 
uh, concerning reasons why people will do this. Some people have the bad attitude towards Scripture. You know, it, it, it's not uncommon today for people to say, Look, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe the Bible is inspired of God. There may even be some who will go so far as to say, uh, I believe that it's all inspired of God. There might even be a few who say, I believe that the Bible is verbally and plenary inspired of God. But you know, it really doesn't apply to us today, the way it was written. We have to, you know, make some allowances because culture has changed. Because man has progressed so far. Things are not like they were. They've got a bad attitude toward the Scripture. And then, as we have already alluded to, some people walk disorderly because they get caught up in the popularity of, of an elder, of an error. And let me take just a minute to say a word about that. Here's a congregation that starts a program of work. And they come up with this really uh, dunking your hat in the creek name for it. Just sounds really good. Well, before you know it, over on the other side of the country... There's another congregation over there doing exactly the same program of work with exactly the same steps, and they're even calling it by the same name. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Please don't understand me. That, that in and of itself is not wrong. But we say that only to illustrate how quickly an error can become popular. This time it, it, it spreads like Johnson grass in one of our Texas highway ditches. And you know how fast that is. Like I said, I don't know how many churches of Christ that is with the name still on their sign that now use instrumental music. But like we said, it's growing. And I know this. In 2012, that year's edition of Churches of Christ in the United States that had previously dropped from uh, their directory Restored them. See, popularity of an, el of an error, it can cause some to start walking disorderly. Anyone who does not understand that churches of Christ, and that includes some who a few years ago were judged to be faithful by us, are in real trouble. Because their eyes are closed. Brethren need to wake up to that or those who remain distinguishable from the denominations of men around us are going to become so few in number that we can accommodate the phrase of one known false teacher will be harder to find than a very small flea on the back of a very large dog. I don't know if how many times we really stop and think how serious the situation is in this matter of fellowship in the Lord's church today. But just think about it. A few years ago, and someone mentioned this to me the other day, just a few years ago, we could travel almost anywhere in this country and we could see the building of uh, a congregation of the Church of Christ, and it's Sunday, we could go in and we could worship together, and we know that what we would hear would be the truth. We knew that what would be practiced would be that which is right in the sight of God. We can't do that anymore. You have to hunt and choose and be very careful. You may walk in and find a find a piano over in the corner or some other 
very serious problem. So frequent today. So if so many walk disorderly and there's all these reasons that they do, why do some continue to fellowship those who walk disorderly? Well, one is the very popular philosophy of today, live and let live, not any of my business, what you do, and it's not any of your business, what I do, and I guess that means that it's not any of God's business either in the minds of these people. Just live and let live. You know, I, I really don't agree with you that uh, the Lord's Supper can be taken on Friday night, but if you want to do that, then by all means, Romans 14 gives you that right to do that. Second of all, there's cronyism, hero worship, or friendship that causes some to continue to fellowship those who are out of fellowship with God, who have made themselves out of fellowship. There are people, men particularly, that we look up to as being well-known and supposedly having a great uh, reputation for being strong in the faith and being very knowledgeable of God's Word and maybe even knowledgeable of, of the, the original languages in which the Bible is written, whatever it might be. All we look up to them. And guess what happens when they fall? They take person after person after person and congregation and congregation down with them when they go. We've seen it happen over and over again. So Paul wrote, Therefore let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. I have a great admiration for the man right over here to my right. I would have greater admiration for him if he let me have another 30 minutes. But be that as it may, he's not my authority. And if he goes wrong, I'm not going to follow him. Not if I can help it. But a lot of people have. Are unauthorized fellowships problem in the church today? They are a big problem. They are a big problem because of false teaching, because of immorality, and because of the innovations of man. You can hardly go anywhere anymore without finding at least one of these. But we have the warning of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. First of all, he said in verse 7, they that sleep are sleeping in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But then down in verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. We have known for a long, long time that <clears throat> Abilene Christian University has been way off the deep end. But now they allow uh, student organization sponsored dances and I suppose even school sponsored dances. It's a problem. Unauthorized fellowships are a problem. But us, we, you and me, we must determine to fellowship only those who are in fellowship with God. Because if we don't, then we're no longer in fellowship with God. Thank you very much. There must be something circulating in the water or whatever. There's been more people. Uh, well, that's not really what I should say. There's been more preachers that have given us back time
There must be a virus around. But we'll take it. I don't know what to think of somebody that says he thinks so much of me and then turn right around and ask me to violate the time period. That's the kind of people that you don't want to listen to when they're in that kind of thing. We, we won't fellowship you in that comment. We'll fellowship the rest of it where you were true. Is that what you taught us today? Uh -huh. No, that was a very fine lesson. It's, you know, back when, oh, when it really first started being emphasized was before the lectureships got to be as prolific as they started in the late 70s, especially 80s. But uh, the lectureship that caused sound brethren who were already disturbed about the liberalism of now going on 50 years ago, they saw what the old Freed Hardeman College did from the late 60s, especially up into the 70s, when they would uh, deal with the issues and expose the errors, and they would just simply, for those who were there then, they just simply over flowed things because none of the other colleges would deal with things that way. And it was because of that, really, that you had certain other lectureships start. They thought, well, if this is happening here, then uh, churches ought to start following the example of a lectureship all day long and for several days. Because some may remember that what used to be considered a church lectureship was usually uh, maybe a week long or a weekend or maybe a Saturday. And they would speak just at night. And, and people would talk about a lectureship that way. Then people started pattering, patterning uh, their lectureships after basically Freed Hardeman in the sense that they went all day long up into the night. And uh, about the first one to do that uh, long years ago was uh, the Getwell Congregation in those days with the Spiritual Sword Lectureship. And then within just a few years... I know we at Muskogee started in 78, uh, Denton 82, uh, I think Southwest 82. It just multiplied all over the place. And even the lectureships that had been at the preacher training schools had never been as attended as others. And then all of a sudden, they began to mushroom. And it all happened because people saw the error in the church and the colleges, which had always had the lectureships, we're not addressing those things. Why did the preacher training school start? Anybody ask that? You already had the Bible faculties in uh, several colleges. Why did they need that? Well, some of you may remember that were back there in those days that there was a furor. And most of the college um, Bible faculties looked down their noses at the preacher training schools. And they, were, they were criticized very highly that you're not getting a well-rounded education and all that kind of thing. But then they came into existence because the Bible faculties and the colleges were not teaching fundamentals and laying a foundation. And thus, uh, I think you could say originally that every one of the preacher training schools in the, in the 60s that started back then in the early 70s all started with that in mind. The second thing being that an older man who had a family and had demonstrated spiritual growth and ability, could go back for a couple of years and get support and go through those. But that's how that began to develop. Then when the group of people in the church who saw that the colleges were all going out in the left field somewhere, the end of which we know not, then they pulled in on the preacher training schools for their support. And then what happens with that? Well, here you see they begin to try to, rather than stay sound and solid on their own two feet based on the Bible and caring nothing about anything else, they begin to act like the colleges and begin to try to be moderate and all that kind of thing rather than just preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, let the chips fall where they may. Now, we remember well back when the schools all started that that was basically the attitude of the Bible faculty. We're going to lay down the fundamentals. We're going to make sure the church is known to be what the New Testament says the church is. Truth is going to be emphasized above anything else. Doctrine is going to be emphasized. And uh, now all that's changing. Well, it just shows that people in every generation uh, will fall away if they're not very, very, very careful. 
So when we hear fellowship, I know of nothing uh, works any better other than to get the eldership all corrupted than to get people in the church to think that they can just go along with about anybody and it's all right. Some way or another justify it. These things don't happen overnight. It takes time for them to develop and it's a slow process. So we thank you for this, this sermon and for the study on the matter of fellowship, fellowshipping only those who are in fellowship with God.